No, if you don't know me at all, my name is Sarah. I've been coming to King's for about eight years or so and have been blessed to be able to come along to Sisterhood probably in the last year and a half. Um, and that is all down to my lovely daughter who's a year and a half and has meant that I work, now work part-time and can come along to Sisterhood on a Thursday. So you might recognise me slightly from running laps at the back trying to prevent Olivia from getting to the baked goods in the corner. Um, so a massive shout out to anyone who is providing all the baked goods. Uh, we really appreciate it. My my stomach appreciates it but if you could maybe make it to look like a broccoli or a carrot I think that might help Olivia stay in one corner and not the other um, but no it's lovely to be here as um, Kath has already said Leanne um, was speaking last week and spoke wonderfully and actually really challengingly um, on the fourth commandment um, about keeping the Sabbath holy and what that could mean to us and the importance of that um, in our day-to-day -day lives and how we can implement that. Um, but I am going to be looking at the fifth commandment and the fifth commandment is in Exodus 20 verse 12 and it says, honour your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. I think that last bit is a tongue twister. There's far too many L's for my accent, but honour your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You see, I love um, this commandment and I was telling my dad actually this week, I'd called him up and I was telling him, you know, um, I'm speaking on honour, you're honouring your father and mother and he laughed at me. So I don't know whether that was a positive thing or a negative thing, um, but dad, if you're watching online, it's sisterhood, you're not welcome um, and you can come back later and I'll tell you a wee preview of it. Um, but no, I, I do love the Ten Commandments. You know, something about the Ten Commandments is, um, I suppose quite often in the world today, um, people are scared to say something or were very easily offended. And even sometimes in the Bible, actually, that's spoken in parables or what seems like riddles, and it can take us a while to figure out what's been said. But the Ten Commandments is just straight to the point. Um, it, God is just telling you what he's telling you. He's quite clear about it. It's obvious about it. Um, and there's no really mincing his words. And I really do... Um, like that and appreciate that about the Ten Commandments. And I was thinking um, about this commandment of honouring your father and mother and I was thinking about our God and I know a few weeks ago you were speaking about how our God is this good and kind and all loving and all powerful and all gracious God with these never ending possibilities and I was thinking about how good and incredibly amazing our God is and all that he has created and then I was thinking about this commandment and I was thinking God, it almost feels like you've messed up a little bit. It almost feels like, why did you think that when you had all the possibilities about how you could bring life into this world, you thought that your plan A and the best option to do that was by a mother and a father coming together in marriage and having a baby, by bringing two sinners who are definitely going to mess up and have a baby and make them responsible for that. And I'm like, Lord, it, does, it almost doesn't make sense. Um, but actually, I have to remember that he knows so much more than I do. He understands the plan and sees the bigger picture so much more than I do. Um, and I have to begin to realise that um, reality, that actually God's plan A, his best plan was to have a mother and a father. His best plan was family. He created us intentionally that we would have family, that we would have influence from people around us um, and that that was his best plan, his plan A. And you know, I don't know um, a lot of you people, I don't know your life situations, I don't know your upbringings, I don't know your situations, I don't know whether you were brought up in a Christian home and experienced a loving mother and father or whether um, you were brought up from a negative or traumatic experience, I don't know whether your family are Christians or non-Christians, I don't know. Um, but our God does and our God knows your parents and he knows um, you. So I can't speak specifically into your circumstances, but what I can speak on is the commandment. I can speak on what God has given us and the command that he has given us to honour our father and mother. So what does it mean to honour? What does that look like for us? Um, and in the Greek, honour, probably going to pronounce it wrong, is tima. And it means to place value on or to fix a price for. It means to have a great respect for. I don't know about you, but growing up, I thought to honour your father and mother meant that I must listen to every single thing they said and obey every single thing they said and for anyone with young kids they're really hoping that it does mean that so that their kids are learnt to to obey everything they're saying but actually it doesn't mean that necessarily it means um that you 
to honour them means that you have to find value in them. You must understand and figure out a way to find value and respect your mother and father. Um, it's understanding that actually our God values your mother and father. He values the responsibility that he's placed in their life. He values um, their place as being a mother and father. And so in doing that, we need to find a way to value them as well. You see, being a parent or being a mother and father are the first opportunity for children to receive from, submit to, or obey a God-given authority. Hello. <laughs> You're okay, don't worry. Um, parents are the first opportunity for children to receive from, submit to, or obey a God-given authority. See, we are born kids. We are born um, young ones who need authority. We need um, someone to show us a way, to guide us what we're going to do, to say yes and to say no, to show us what is right and what is wrong. Um, and you see, in learning how to do that, um, in parents and mothers and fathers showing us how to do that is how we develop character. Um, it's how we build character and how we learn how to receive information. It's how we learn how to respect other people. It's how we learn to receive and how to give love around us. It shows us how to listen and how to obey. You see, as young children, when we start to learn how to honour and obey and respect our parents, it actually teaches us and sets us up for our future. If we're, te if we're learned as young people to how to respect our parents, it becomes easier to then respect our elders when we're older, to respect the authority and the teachers in the school. It becomes easier to respect um, and honour our husbands in marriage. It, it becomes easier to respect and honour authority around us. But ultimately, when we are doing that, that, um, as young kids and we're teaching the principle of teach or honouring and respecting it actually teaches us how to honour and respect our God which is the ultimate aim is that we would know how to show honour and respect to our heavenly father um, but in doing that we need to learn the principles here on earth we need to learn that um, to our own mothers and fathers and so I was thinking well how can I I suppose, make this more relatable for you. How can I make you implement this and see how I actually, what does that mean for me? And where better to go than the Bible um, to find biblical examples of how God demonstrated um, his relationships between mothers and fathers or fathers and sons in the Bible. Um, and so first up, I'm going to look at the story of Abraham um, and Tara. I actually don't know if I'm pronouncing the name right. Does anyone know? Is, is it Tara, the father? Yeah, there we go. We'll go with that. Um, lovely. So Abraham and Tara. Um, and you probably know um, the story of Abraham. He is so well known in the Bible and so in influential in the Christian faith. And he is known to be the father of nations. He is known for his obedience to God. He is known um, for his respect and honour and honouring of God's way. But what you might not know about Abraham is Abraham was brought up in a place called Ur. Um, and he was brought up by a man called Tara or Tara um, and Tara was not a Christian man. Tara was actually known um, to be a pagan worshipper and to worship other gods around him. And, it, and Ur was known to be a place um, of pagan worship. You see, Abraham, when he was brought into this world as a child, he wasn't brought into a Christian loving family, supporting him and sending him in his way to know all things about God. He was brought into a family and a father who was worshipping other gods that if you looked at that family, you thought, well, it doesn't make sense. There's no way that God can use and implement and be in that family situation. And yet this story is beautiful that in Acts, we actually find out that it was when Abraham was in Ur, he was in this place of pagan worship that God called him. And it said, and in Acts, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Macedonia, which is an Ur or is in, um, before um, he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get out of the country and from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. And so Abraham's call is to leave his relatives and to leave um, the place and to go to the land that God would show him. And we don't know if Terah knew about this or not. We don't know if Abraham told his father or not, but Terah made the decision to leave Ur and take his family um, and go to a place called Canaan. 
And they go on this journey and Abraham along the way um, stands by his father. He goes with the father on this journey and honours and respects and loves him on this journey and remains with him. And they settle in a place called Haran on the journey. And in Haran, um, Ab or Terah actually passes away. And it is a point when he passes away that then God is able to use Abraham and calls him into everything that he had to be. But you see, at that point, he was able to be called on, but God didn't forsake him because he was honouring and following his father in the midst of that. God saw Abraham's heart in the midst of heartache, in the midst um, of a relationship with a father who didn't follow God. You know, I think sometimes we can put God in a box and sometimes we think that, you know what, well, my, my parents aren't Christians um, and my family aren't Christians and the people around me um, aren't Christians. And, and so I don't really see how honouring God or honouring them makes sense because that's a biblical principle. And why would I honour a parent if they don't really understand God? Um, and actually, we don't think that God can come into circumstances um, and come into situations if it seems so ungodly. But our God can reach Abraham in the place where it seems so ungodly. He can reach you and your family in circumstances that seem so out with um, what you can imagine. But you see, we are called to honour our parents regardless of their faith, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of where they stand in their opinions with your life. We are called to honour and respect them, to find a way to love them in the midst of it, even if you don't agree. We have to honour them the way Abraham honoured Terah. Or maybe you maybe relate a little bit more with the likes of Esther and Mordecai. Um, Esther as well is, is very well known in scripture and um, she is this woman that we know was um, young and was actually raised up um, and became queen. And she has this a beautiful story where everyone is like, wow, Esther, look at what she's done, how courageous, how bold she was. And you know, Esther um, was an orphan girl that she did not have her earthly uh, mother and father with her. Um, but actually she was adopted or adopted as such by adopted and raised by her cousin Mordecai and the beautiful thing about this is Mordecai looks at Esther and he obviously ticks on the responsibility he says you know I am going to be a father figure to this girl I'm going to tick on the responsibility and um, I can see this young girl that needs loved that she needs supported that she needs an upbringing that she needs someone to point her to Jesus and I am going to take on that responsibility he didn't have to do it but he chose to take on the responsibility to love her and to direct her closer to God. And we know from the book of Esther that um, Esther has the opportunity to become queen. And in doing that, she hides her identity um, as a Jew. And she says, um, hides her identity in order to get to this position. Um, and in doing that, um, the Jewish or the Jews and Mordecai's lives eventually um, become threatened. Um, that actually in that they become threatened and it's Esther's responsibility um, to be able to set them free. It's uh, Esther's responsibility to save them in this moment. And so often I think we look at her as queen and we think oh, she made such a courageous choice to be able to step in and to be able to save this nation. She made such a courageous choice. But actually what we don't realise um, is Mordecai's story behind her. You see, it was Mordecai that took the steps and the actions in her life to be able to direct her to know what to do. It was Mordecai um, in her life that actually told her that she was for such a time as this. It was Mordecai input of years and years and years of pouring into her life, of loving on her, of respecting her, of showing her Jesus that meant that when he did say those things, when he poured that input in, that she knew that she could trust it, that she knew that actually what he was saying um, had power, that what he was saying held weight, um, that he didn't just kind of kind of flaff around and didn't really up, bring her up that well and didn't have a good relationship with her and didn't input anything and then expect her to listen to him um, at a time of need. No, he had years of input in Esther's life that then went, meant at this critical moment, she knew that despite her life being at risk, that despite the opportunity um, for her to go in and actually die doing this, it, she knew that it was worth listening to Mordecai in this moment. It was worth um, respecting and honouring his wish in that moment. 
You see, Mordecai invested, he cared for, he loved, he went in the depth, um, he went from one end of the world to the other to try um, and look after and care for this girl. He didn't know that her future um, was being queen and that it would turn into saving the Jews. He didn't know that when she was a young girl, um, but he went day in, day out, loving on this young girl. And I wonder um, if we could relate to that a little bit. I wonder if you're maybe in here today and you're thinking um, that maybe you don't have earthly parents here, but you have father figures or parental figures around you. And um, maybe you're strong and you're independent um, and you're filled with courage and you're filled with boldness and um, circumstances come your way and the world hits you in different places. And sometimes you think, um, you know what, I, I, I've got this, I can manage this. And yet you have godly people around you who are pouring in wisdom, who are pouring in advice. Um, and I wonder, are you listening to those voices? Are you thinking, no, I've got this, I'm own and I'm fine and I'm just going to go and I'm, uh, you're crippled by fear and you're crippled by the circumstance and you're not listening to the parental vigor figures that God has put in your life, that you're not honouring and respect and what they're actually saying into your life because you actually haven't, um, I suppose, considered them as a father and a mother in your life. You see, if Esther um, didn't take Mordecai seriously, if she thought, well, he's not really my father, so it doesn't really matter what he's saying, um, it doesn't matter, she wouldn't have done what she had done. The Jews would not have been saved in that moment because she wouldn't have trusted in the wisdom that he was pouring in. I wonder if we could check ourselves to see whether we um, are bending to the circumstances um, and being overcome by our own lives. Or are we listening to the voices of wisdom around us, guiding us in the right direction? Or um, do we relate to the story of Jesus and Mary? I can hear you all saying amen. I want to relate to the story of Jesus. Perfect. Um, but I don't think I can do this um, without, um, I suppose, giving us the perfect example that has been given, the biblical representation. And that is that Jesus, the saviour of the world, came down to earth in flesh and had a mother and a father. Um, he had a mother and a father. And I think that it, it's absolutely mind blowing when you think about it, that Jesus, the saviour of the world, who really, really doesn't need any help, has a mother and a father. You see, he was a kid, he was brought up, he was cuddled, he was loved, he was supported, he was encouraged, he was sent to school. Um, he was just like any other kid. And Mary and Joseph had that responsibility to bring him up. And yet, Although he didn't necessarily need it, he shows us the importance in scripture of how he could honour and respect his mum and his dad in the midst of it. He showed us the importance of doing that. And you see, the best bit is, is that Mary didn't get it right. Uh, she wasn't perfect. She didn't do everything right. Actually, she lost him for days and end when he was a kid. Um, it actually said in, in Mark how at points when Jesus was doing his ministry that Mary and the disciples went in to try and rescue him from the situation of what they thought was threatening when actually it was, it was Jesus that was meant to be there for a reason and they didn't understand. You see, Mary and Joseph didn't always understand what Jesus was actually called to do. They do, she'd done the best by her ability. She tried in every way possible, but she didn't always get it right. And it brought me back to Jesus's first miracle. And um, it's when Jesus turned water into wine. And it's actually Mary that initiates the miracle. It is Mary that comes to Jesus and, um, and tells Jesus that actually the wedding party, they're running out of wine and it would be an incredible disgrace and an embarrassment to the family um, if they ran out. And um, Jesus turns and says to her, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Um, and many scholars have suspected that because um, Jesus called Mary woman, it meant that actually this was a place of teaching, that he wasn't looking at her as a mother in that moment. But then you see on, and Jesus done the miracle anyway. He done the miracle anyway, even when he had said, my time has yet not come. And I, I don't know for sure, and maybe this is me speculating, but I wonder whether part of why Jesus done a miracle was he saw it important to honour and respect and love on his mother in that moment. You see, it wasn't a big, massive, fancy miracle. It was low key, it was hidden. Not even everyone in the wedding party knew what had happened. But I wonder if Jesus saw the importance of honouring and loving his mother in the moment. And even if that is me speculating, even if that was not the real reason behind it, 
even right up to Jesus' death, he respects and he loves um, Mary the whole way through. It comes to the end when he is um, about to die and he also um, ensures that John um, is going to look after her once he's gone. He makes sure that she will be loved and that she will be supported and that she would not be cast to the side after going, but actually someone would be there to make sure that all her needs would be met. But the thing I love most about the story of Jesus and Mary is that Jesus shows us that it is possible to obey God and honour our mother and father. You see, Jesus knew that Mary and Joseph were sinners and that a lot of the time they were getting it wrong and that they were making mistakes. But yet he knew that he could still show them respect. He could still show them love. He could still come alongside them and also never jeopardise his calling or his relationship uh, with God or jeopardise um, him being the saviour of the world. He knew that he could do both. And sometimes I think, it's what we think it's one or the other. We think, well, you don't really know my family, we don't know my circumstances, um, but I, I can't do both. You can't do both. Well, God proves um, that we actually, we can. And so I wonder where that leaves us. I wonder where you would find yourself um, in these examples. Are you um, at the start where you're still actually thinking, well, you know what, God, I don't, I don't think that I'm plan A, that I maybe, I don't think that you meant for me to be with the parents that I am with, or actually, I don't think that you meant for me to have the children that I have. God has put you in that place for a reason. Um, you are, whether you believe it or not right now, you are God's plan A for your family. Um, that you're there for a purpose and you have a reason and you have a plan. Um, and I know it can be difficult and I know the circumstances and I've heard stories of circumstances and situations where it is not easy and I'm not undermining that in any way. But you're there for a reason. Um, God did not make a mistake with that. Or can you relate to any of the biblical stories and examples I've just said? Um, do you feel like Abraham, where you're from a non-Christian background and you're surrounded by non-Christians and immersed in that culture? Um, maybe you're struggling um, to see that God can move in your family. Maybe you're struggling to see um, and think that actually in the midst of all this ungodliness that God can make a way. He can. He can see um, the unseen. He can move in where there seems to be no way. We can't put God in a box in our lives. We can't think that our family is an exemption. Um, but actually God can reach and make a way in your family um, where there is no way. Or maybe you feel like you're like Esther, where maybe you don't have a mother and father figure uh, or mother and father as such, but you maybe are surrounded um, by Christian influences and people who are speaking into your life. I wonder would we challenge ourselves to actually listen to the voices around us, to weigh up whether they are the, those of God and say, actually, you know what, there, there is people who I can honour and show honour and show respect to. There is, there's people around me um, that are loving on me and that I should be listening to. Or I wonder, are we like Jesus, where we're in a Christian family um, and we feel like it should be easy to honour our mother and father, but actually we can see that they're making mistakes again and again and again. Um, and sometimes we can get frustrated with it. I wonder if we could be a people of grace where we could show that actually we know that they're just trying their best and they're not going to get it right, but we have a responsibility to honour them and to love them um, and to see value in them despite what's going on. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you've thought, Sarah, this has been a lovely, a lovely chat about how the younger generation um, and how all the children should be honouring their mothers and their fathers. Um, you might be thinking, well, actually, the generation today needs it and they need to be taught this lesson. And you would be exactly right. Um, we absolutely do. But maybe you're sitting in here and you're like, well, this commandment's not necessarily applicable to me anymore. Maybe my earthly mother and father are not here anymore. Um, and, and so I'm looking at the generations below me. Well, I wonder if we could flip this concept on its head as well. And I wonder um, if we could question ourselves and turn the light on ourselves. You see, it's so, so easy to expect honour. It's so easy to expect respect. But are we worthy of the honour we're expecting? Are we worthy um, of the generations below us uh, honouring us? See, since becoming a mum, and I know I'm only a year and a half in, so I, I really still don't have a clue, to be honest. Um, but I don't want to be a mum or I don't want to be someone or a parent that makes it difficult for Olivia to honour me. 
I don't want to be a mum that makes it difficult for Olivia to honour God's commandments. I don't want to be that person that makes it difficult to follow the ways that God has for her. I want to make that as easy and as convenient and as available to her as I possibly can. And if that means I need to turn the light on myself, that means I need to turn the light on myself. I can't expect her uh, to honour me if I don't challenge myself and see, am I worthy of honour? And this doesn't mean I bend over backwards and be her best friend and make sure that um, I do everything that she asks and allow the world to direct her paths and um, chip in just now and again. It means that I do everything in my power to honour God as best I can, to do everything in my power to seek him and seek his guidance for my family um, and see where he's leading my family to be. That I would be like Mordecai and I would direct and point her to the ways of God. And as she goes in her journey, that she would know that I am here, um, that if she does need advice, if she does um, need wisdom and guidance, that she knows that what I have to say holds weight, it holds value because I've earned that over the years. And I wonder um, if we could look at ourselves um, and challenge ourselves. Are we worthy of honour? Are we worthy of people listening and respecting what we have to say? If I expect Olivia to listen to me, I have to be able to listen to her. If I expect her to respect me, I have to be able to respect her. If I expect her to forgive me, I have to be able to forgive her. And if I expect her to be teachable, then I also need to be teachable. I wonder if we could turn the spotlight on ourselves this morning as well um, and challenge our own worthiness with it. I'd done a response with the youth um, a few weeks ago when I was speaking to them and it was on Psalm 139 and it was about how David was talking about how God knew him and knew everything about him. He knew every detail and there was no dark corner that he could go um, that, could out, that could hide from his love or hide from him in any way. Um, and I was, I was drawn back from it because I was like, God, you, you do really know me. And then it goes to the end of it. And David asked God to search his heart and see if there is any offensive way in him. Um, and I wonder if that's something we could maybe consider this morning. Um, if we could search our own hearts and see if there is any offensive way in us. If we could search our hearts and say, God, how can I honour my mother and father um, better? How can I be a better mother and father to those around us? Um, and challenge us that we wouldn't just go away and act the same, but we would go away challenged um, and ready to change, um, to make God's Ten Commandments a little bit more um, accessible um, to us. And so I've got a few questions um, that I would love for us to discuss our tables and pray over our tables. Um, oh, it's me that does the buzzer, two seconds. There we go. Lovely. Um, so yeah, I wonder, I'll pray and then if we just get in our groups and our tables um, and we can go through um, the discussions and yeah, um, let the Lord do what he's going to do. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, Lord, that uh, Lord, that you are so present and so kind and so loving, Father, that you know every circumstance, every situation and every person in this room. And Lord, you know when this commandment might seem easy and you know when this commandment might test every bone in our body, Father. But I thank you, God, that you know us and that you care for us. So, Father, I pray today, Lord, that as we do um, take Psalm 139 seriously, Father, and as we do search our own hearts, Father, I pray that you would show us where we're going wrong, that you would show us where we can change and challenge ourselves and make us yourself a little bit more like you. Father, I pray that we would be a people um, who honour our mother and father as well, but we would also be a people that make it easy for the generation below us to honour um, because we are so like-minded and so in pursuit of everything that you are. So Father, would you come and you meet us now in your beautiful name, we pray and believe. Amen.